So um, it's top of the hour, so I'll begin. Um, welcome everyone to the second Health Outcome Area Working Group. And uh, my name is Ann Nguyen. I am the Engagement and Operations Manager with the Office of Broadband and Digital Literacy, part of the California Department of Technology. And um, a few keeping house, housekeeping items before we begin. Um, next slide, please. So as you um, know, this meeting will be recorded and all of our post-meeting materials will be uploaded online in um, our broadband portal past events. Our ASL interpreters are being spotlighted along with our other speakers. So please view in side-by-side -side, um, speaker mode or gallery mode when we have our open discussion. Closed captions are available and you can click on it um, to CC closed caption on your toolbar in the bottom of your Zoom um, screen. We invite you all to introduce yourselves in the chat, share your name, pronouns, organization, title, where you're joining us from. And of course, use the chat throughout the meeting to um, engage in the conversation. We welcome all types of engagement. And lastly, um, please use the hand raise feature to elevate yourself on top of my screen so I can know to unmute you um, when we're doing our open discussion. And um, with that, next slide, please. Today's agenda, um, similarly to last time, if you were able to join us, but um, a welcome, a quick recap of what we talked about in February, a few contextual slides for those who are new um, to the outcome area working group this month. Um, next is the opening panel where they will um, we convene subject matter experts who will kick us off our um, conversation by sharing how digital equity barriers create health disparities and specifically how their organizations are working to address digital equity barriers. And then we'll open up the floor for a community-wide discussion on chat, verbally, however um, you want to engage. And then next, Richna will talk through how to take action. And um, lastly, closing with next steps and um, the few meeting dates that we have scheduled. So with that, next slide, please. Okay, just so you know, so the next three slides will be very quick. And I wanted to, um, show here the eight cover population that we will be referring to many times over the course of these next few months and in all of our meetings. The Digital Equity Act prioritized investment for the eight cover populations listed below. And my colleague will activate the poll. And so if you're not a co-host, you'll be able to um, tell us which of the eight cover population you represent and or serve. The couple will be open for 30 to a minute, so please fill it out. And um, by the fourth slides, we'll um, share the results of the poll. So next slide, please. Thank you. And so, um, so you all know too, for folks who weren't here in February, our team is planning many engagement um, events throughout these next few months. Our group is the Outcome Area Working Groups. And in the next slide, I'll let you know the objectives and outcomes that we're hoping to achieve. However, know that we are scheduling 48, 50 plus engagement sessions to meet people where they are in terms of virtually and timing wise and in-person local um, regional outreach events. So please know that this is not the one place to share your feedback and engage with the state digital equity planning process. We hope to see you throughout all of our um, outcome area working groups events um, virtually and as well as our in-person events. Um, next slide, please. And then the working group objectives are listed here and I won't go over it one by one, but essentially our outcome area working group <clears throat> is meant to convene subject matter experts and practitioners together to develop strategies that align with our state digital equity plan priorities through the lens of the digital equity barriers of the eight covered populations that I mentioned above. Next slide, please. And I would like to introduce you to our graduate student, assistant and researcher, 
Latifa, who's working with our Health Outcome Area Working Group um, and coming to us from the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. Latifa. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for that introduction. My name is Latifa, and I'll take you through uh, the key takeaways from our last meeting. Uh, so during the February Working Group meeting, we had input from stakeholders and community uh, members on the barriers that they face to digital equity. Uh, the access issue came up as a common barrier. We saw that lack of broadband access can prevent people from accessing healthcare. We also saw that access to devices and digital skills came up as another common barrier. Lastly, we discussed and heard from the community about existing digital equity initiatives. And some of the, th some of the ones that came up were partnerships with healthcare providers and training digital navigators in assisting the community navigating their digital devices, that these are initiatives that have proven successful in um, fighting digital equity. Next slide. And thank you so much, Latifa. Um, we're really excited to welcome our guest speakers at this upcoming March, or at this March, Outcome Area Working Group meetings. Um, what I'll do first is introduce their names, and uh, my team will highlight them in the following order. And they're coming to us hoping to kick off our conversation addressing the types, the barriers um, that is facing the communities they face, the digital equity barriers, and the ways that their organization is addressing these barriers. So um, they are as followed, Marissa Montana from Insure the Uninsured Projects, May Kwong from the Center for Connected Health Policy, Catherine Kim from the Health Innovation Center, MITRE Labs, Leticia Alejandres from California Emerging Technology Fund, and lastly, we have Andrew Broderick from the SF Tech Council. So Marissa, please take us away. Thanks, Anne. Um, as Anne mentioned, my name is Marisha Montano. Um, I'm the Director of Policy with Insure the Uninsured Project, uh, more commonly known as ITEP. ITEP is a health policy nonprofit that got our start over 25 years ago, making sure that all Californians had access to health insurance coverage. And after the passing of the Affordable Care Act, many coverage expansion wins and, and many coverage expansion wins in California, we've shifted our focus to making sure that that insurance card is meaningful. And that includes making sure that the future of the healthcare delivery system is accessible to all of our California communities. To answer your questions, and uh, inequities in broadband and connectivity, they really deepen health disparities that have persisted long before the pandemic and have worsened since the pandemic. When we talk about, um, we talk a lot about social determinants of health and, and we talk about those, those conditions in which a person lives, works, learns, plays, and otherwise engages with society. And broadband and digital barriers exacerbate many, exacerbate inequities in many of the social determinants of health, making it really a super determinant of health. And so when you ask how digital inequity impacts health outcomes, digital barriers um, prevent those that have already lacked access to care from using tools like telehealth um, for more accessible health care. And even more so, um, during the pandemic, the healthcare workforce crisis has also worsened um, due to burnout and many other um, factors. Uh, and digital inequities prevent us from using telehealth and virtual care to also fill in some of those workforce gaps, um, not only for specialties, but for also primary care and behavioral health, which has it has the ability to really impact um, health outcomes for many of our vulnerable uh, communities. For over two years now, ITEP has been working at the local, state, and national level, prioritizing connecting healthcare and health policy stakeholders into opportunities for solution-driven ways to break down barriers to healthcare, uh, whether that means connecting a hospital to the right people in their community to become an anchor institution, providing broadband and connectivity to the communities that they serve, um, or building awareness for the historical opportunities that we have in front of us to address digital inequities at the state level, and bringing an understanding of how broadband and digital equities, um, are uh, breaking down broadband and digital inequities are, um, 
are necessary to allowing our most vulnerable co uh, communities, those highlighted in the covered populations and more populations uh, to have all the tools they need to engage with their, with their healthcare when, how, and in whatever way is meaningful for them. ITUP also um, serves as a connector and a convener, helping our healthcare focused network, um, including local and regional healthcare ecosystem partners, community based organizations, and health policy stakeholders track and show up to stakeholder processes like these, this one. Um, we really have the privilege of being able to take the time to track and synthesize and translate and learn a whole new policy area. Um, and we try to harness that um, privilege that we have to bring to help our health audience um, to harness any opportunities there are to advance digital equity to make healthcare more accessible. Thanks, Anne. Thank you. And before um, before you leave us, can you tell us a little bit about the item um, broadband boot camp that's coming up in April? Yeah, we're planning um, things on, uh, and we're, um, ITEP is planning an event um, that is a small workshop um, to both bring education about broadband and what it is and what, um, what it costs and all the, how these investments in broadband work, and then workshopping a little bit um, deeper, workshopping into how state healthcare leaders can um, engage and use leverage these opportunities to um, to break down digital barriers to health. Um, so, if anyone has any interest in learning more, um, please please contact me. I'll put my email in the chat. Thanks. Thank you so much. And next, we have May Hong from the Center for Connected Health Policy, and I know you're also part of a coalition in California. would love for you to talk about that as well. Thank you, Anne, um, and thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning. My name is May Kwong. As Anne said, I'm with the Center for Connected Health Policy. A little bit of background on exactly who we are. We are um, actually a California organization that was first founded in 2009 to focus in on California telehealth policy. We're a program underneath the Public Health Institute, and we were receiving various grant funding to do our work in California. However, an opportunity to become the National Telehealth Policy Research Center became available through grant funding from HRSA. Uh, we applied for that, we got it, and we've been serving in that capacity ever since. That was back in 2012. So so we're also a organization that only, not only has a California focus, but we have a national focus as well. What we do in our federal work is that we provide technical assistance and create uh, resources and materials on telehealth policy. So we have helped everybody from the White House to congressional members to other states, um, various programs, particularly in Medicare and Medicaid, and also health systems providers. And when the pandemic hit, we found ourselves increasingly also helping patients directly who had questions about what is this telehealth stuff? I've never heard of it before. Um, so what the pandemic did was it really highlighted health disparities, I think, where technology is involved. Because when the pandemic hit, there was this sharp pivot towards telehealth. But, you know, as someone who's been in telehealth for over 10 years before the pandemic, if I if you spoke to my family and my friends, they probably weren't quite sure what I still did for a living. But then when the pandemic hit, they said, oh, telehealth, now we understand what you do for a living. We get it now. So that was probably like very indicative of what the general population was going through during the beginning months of COVID-19. It's like, what is this telehealth? How do, how do we use it? And can I use it? Because that one thing that was really highlighted by the pandemic is that not everybody has equitable access to the technology, to the connectivity that will allow them to use telehealth. Now, I was watching the poll that Anne conducted just a few minutes ago, and it's very interesting to see the populations you all represent. And uh, CCHP, as a policy organization, we don't necessarily represent a particular population, but our charge, our mission as an organization is really to help all of those populations as far as the policies are concerned. We are not an advocacy organization. We are primarily a resource organization. We provide educational materials. We do convenings. We do um, 
technical assistance. And in that way, we help shape and form policy through these various activities that we do. Uh, in California, as I mentioned, we have a California focus as well, and Anne also alluded to this too. We run a coalition that started back in 2011, so it's been over 10 years since this coalition has been um, active, that gathers together statewide organizations and individuals who are interested in California telehealth policy. Now, we started that organization really kind of ad hoc. It was around a piece of legislation that was going through the, the process and, and supporters of that bill were, hey, can you just keep us informed on what's going on with that bill? So it started with six groups saying, hey, can you keep us informed? to now uh, 13, 12 years later, where we have about 175 different organizations who are not only California organizations, but also national organizations who are interested in what's going on in California policy. And a lot of the focus that uh, the coalition members have is on telehealth, but it's on connected health in general, because that also feeds in to, to telehealth as well. And a lot of the policies impact um, the populations that a lot of people here represent and that CCHP itself is also very interested in, the Medicaid population, the underserved rural populations, the aging, those with disabilities, those who are in, um, who are people of color, those are community and other communities as well. So really there's this intersection on what we do with telehealth policy, while we may not serve a specific population directly, because the policy actually impacts those services that people receive, uh, that's where our work comes in. Now, I'm not gonna repeat what Marissa went over. I'm just gonna say ditto to everything Marissa covered, but at one area of policy that I also do wanna highlight as well is the technology end and also access to that technology and whether everyone has that. And as I said earlier, the COVID pandemic really highlighted the issue of not everyone has access to that, and that creates disparities in their ability to receive health services. Not everybody has a smartphone, not everybody has a laptop, but even if they do, the question is, are they comfortable or do they have the, the background, and I don't want to say training, but maybe more education or knowledge in like how to use that in order to access health services. So it's really almost sort of like a, it, there used to be something called the triple A for those in healthcare who heard, heard that and there was a stool for it and it had three legs. Well, sort of with, with um, connected health, there are sort of three legs to that as well too. There's that broadband leg, but there's also the access to technology. And then there's also the educational portion of that and like being able to understand how to use that technology to be able to access services. So I'll stop there and I think I'm supposed to hand it over next to Catherine, but that's basically a bit of background about what we do and how we work on that. And if you're interested in joining the coalition, like Marissa, I'll put my name, my email into the chat and you can contact me if you're not already a member. Thank you for that, May, and thank you for um, refer, aligning your three A's to our four cornerstones of digital equity barriers, which is access, uh, affordability, adoption, and digital literacy and inclusion. So I see a lot of um, alignment there, too. And um, yes, next up is Catherine. Um, thank you for joining us. And just to reiterate the question for new folks who just joined us, um, please share how digital equity barriers create health disparities and specifically how um, your organizations are working in the communities to address digital equity barriers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a project called Activate, which started because there are digital equity barriers, not just for the patients in rural and underserved communities to access digital health, um, which is sort of the broad range of connected technologies that support health, but the community clinics also have their own infrastructure barriers. Right, they, they don't have uh, some of the updated technologies they would need to deliver digital health. They didn't have staff who were um, prepared to run digital health programs uh, when, the COVID, when COVID pandemic really started. And they didn't have the resources to support their patients. So when we started the Activate project, we were trying to address access to technology for both the health centers and for their patients and the ability to implement these programs. So what we did was 
we co-designed a, a platform with the health centers, their patients and community members that would allow the, the infrastructure to be provided for remote patient monitoring and telehealth and made sure that all of that, all those systems could be integrated across the spectrum. So data from devices that the patients were using, technology access for the patients so they had um, connectivity and tablets and smartphones, that information could come into the clinic, be provided to the medical assistants, the health coaches, the outreach staff, and the providers, could be used in the process of providing care management, and then the data could flow to the electronic health record system. So again, it's the technology, it's the services, it's the workflow, and it's the data integration. So we provided um, all of that um, that kind of technology and services and implemented the system in four community health centers in California. Um, now they're serving hundreds of patients with diabetes and hypertension. Um, these patients are, are actively using the technology and really achieving um, really great results. So we've had substantial improvements in hemoglobin A1C and blood pressure for these patients. And the, the health centers are really seeing lots of value for their own operations. Um, so we have four health centers using this in California, um, and that has been very successful. But what that really spurred for us was the need in digital equity to be addressing how do you create um, interventions, programs um, that can be efficient and effective and, um, and, and share that with, with all kinds of communities so they can develop their own programs. And that spurred a, a research project for us that we're calling the Community Connectivity Framework for Digital Health Equity. Um, that research project is attempting to bring together all the information about what are the important components of planning that you need to think about to create a technology-based um, health equity program. Um, how can you go about actually developing that using best practices and um, creativity and innovation for things that we don't have best practices to really address? How do we evaluate those things? How do we know where the right measures are to know that we have uh, accomplished our aims? Um, and how do we then disseminate that across um, all of our communities? So that research project is in progress. We have completed the first phase of it, um, where we will be doing a lot of community engagement work this, uh, this year. Um, to validate what we have found and to start building um, toolkits so that others can take advantage of what, what we have done. And we'd be very happy to be um, you know, working with this, this community as it's uh, developing California to bring that work out. So in summary, um, we're really trying to address the comprehensive barriers to digital health equity across the health centers and other underserved community organizations um, that are serving underserved communities, excuse me, um, as well as the individuals who um, those organizations are trying to serve. So that comprehensive view of digital health equity, and then bringing our research expertise to take those learnings, to take those that information and share it um, more broadly um, so that we can get impact across all of the health communities in California. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. I love the comprehensive and the multifaceted intervention that um, you and your team designed. So um, next up, we have Leticia Alejandres from CETF. Great. Thank you so much. And um, Catherine, I'm really happy to follow you because I'm going to have to follow up with you too. Uh, my name again is Leticia Alejandres, and I'm the Director of Telehealth and Human Services with the California Emerging Technology Fund. And CETF um, is a little bit of an oddball organization because we are a nonprofit. Uh, we were formed by the California Public Utilities Commission when there were mergers with some of the uh, internet service providers and um, uh, telephone mergers going on. Now, we're not governed by them in any way, not the PUC and not providers, uh, internet service providers. Uh, but our mission has been to close the digital divide. And as all of us know on this call, the digital divide had become even more important with COVID. And I, I like to say that COVID as tragic as, as it has been, has been the gift that keeps on giving. And what it has done is it has put a spotlight on where those gaps are. And it has also said how dangerous it is to not have access to internet. And um, I think that the work that we do, we work at the state level, 
and we work with, in partnership with uh, nonprofits, government, and we are that catalyst for change. Our goal, as I said, is to close the digital divide. And my area in particular, I work in telehealth, but the ways that we have been working, and I, I will get specifically to the inequities that, that cause disparities, but the way we've done our work is that one, uh, we've done fact finding. So we, we brought together and you can look at our website. I'll, I, I will put it in the chat after, after my, my comments. Uh, we brought together all the stakeholders in telehealth to study, okay, what's working, what's not, what do we need to, need to do differently? And uh, what we found uh, was there were three things in particular. One is that there needed to be payment parity, right? Whether it's in whether it's an in-person visit or a um, a virtual visit. We also um, recognize from that fact finding that you there has to be ubiquitous internet access for folks. And the third is that there needs to be state policy, statewide policy, beyond just reimbursement policy. And so we're working at that level uh, to get uh, attention with our policymakers to help them to understand, look, we need to have a set policy for telehealth so that we can really uh, understand and um, someone needs to be accountable for individual health outcomes as well as population health. And we know unless and until um, someone is responsible for it, we won't have a policy and we need to have that. Now, let me let me just back up a minute. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about um, the work that we've done. Uh, when COVID hit, we, our board decided to do a pilot project with skilled nursing facilities. And you all probably remember seeing those horrible images of what was happening on the East Coast in skilled nursing facilities, the death and destruction that was going on. We uh, immediately began a pilot project to learn, okay, what is it going to take to implement telehealth in skilled nursing facilities? And really from that, there were so many lessons that we learned, but one was uh, we wanted to know how do we keep the spread of COVID? How do we, how do we limit that spread? And we, we really believed that telehealth would help uh, relieve the spread of COVID. In addition to that, we knew that um, reducing transfers of patients. And remember, in skilled nursing facilities, quite often they're elderly folks who are who are um, who are vulnerable and fragile. You don't want to have to get somebody dressed, sit in the hallway for two hours, and then get transported to the hospital, and then at the same time, um, the transport team as well as the emergency department folks are now exposed if you have COVID. So that's what we studied. We learned that, um, that it does indeed has the promise telehealth to prevent that from happening. In addition to that, uh, we received, and again, that's also on our website. We also studied through the, a big grant from the Federal Communications Commission to implement telehealth um, with skilled nursing facilities. We're working with 10 organizations um, skilled nursing facilities, uh, FQHCs, uh, community clinics, uh, tribal clinics, and a critical access hospital. Again, helping them to implement telehealth. What we learned with them, and this is with regard to disparities, and, and again, I, I, I know that some of my colleagues have, have shared that, I think it was Marissa says that internet is really a social determinant of health. It most certainly is. And I would add to that internet and telehealth. And I think that what we have learned is on both sides of not only as from the clinical perspective and the patient perspective, this is consistent. You need to have access to the internet. You need to have a device. You have to know how to use it. You need to have digital literacy. And I, I often cite um, a personal experience that I have with one of my family members who has gone from one health system to another uh, because she's had difficulty navigating telehealth. And this is a person that has internet, that speaks English, um, but doesn't know how to navigate the telehealth experience. 
And what I re realized with that is that, and no one was teaching her that. And on the other side of the equation, you had providers, I'm sure they were getting frustrated with her um, because they weren't connecting, it was taking too long, all those different things were happening. But I think in short, I think it's, it's really important um, to recognize that telehealth is not possible with, without internet. And let me just step back for another second. Another area of work that we're spending a lot of time, at, time with is the affordable connectivity program. This is ACP, this is, provides a subsidy to low-income communities, right? We are working and we are eager to work with you and others to get folks enrolled. What we know is that there are 5.8 million Californians who are eligible, households that are eligible for this subsidy. The challenge is we need to reach them. And quite often in order to reach them, you have to have several touch points. They need to hear from you like eight different times before they take action. We are coordinating with state agencies as well as nonprofits uh, for an event in April. And it's not the only event we will do, but we've been doing them for several uh, several months now to get people enrolled. We have a toolbox available. I, I put it in the chat and I'll put it in there again. But in any case, all that said is that with the question with regard, you know, how do these disparities come into play? It has to do with, if you are poor, if you are an immigrant, if you live in a rural community, if you are disabled, if you are a senior citizen, you are less likely to have access to the internet. And if you don't have access to the internet, and I know I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, it's difficult to have a doctor's appointment. It's difficult to participate in society. It's difficult to sign up for public services. So those are the areas that we're working with. And we work in partnership with so many other folks and we welcome that partnership with others as well. And I just wanna say uh, one more thing, and that's that um, digital inequities really mirror the economic disparities. So we're talking about the same populations. And uh, I just wanna end that our goal is to ensure that a California gets its fair share of these resources that are available for the internet and get folks enrolled. And we are especially focused on unconnected and underconnected communities. And our work goes beyond um, telehealth and, 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 and uh, our, our work focuses on digital equity across the board. You're hearing about last mile, middle mile. We're working in that area as well to make sure that we prioritize those communities that do not have access. So I will stop there, put some information in the chat and um, thank you for giving me just a moment. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing that insight and in your work. And I'm glad you're here and to share that and underline a lot of um, the sentiments that we all share, the mission that we all share. Um, Andrew, do you mind coming off me? Thank you, Anne, and good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Broderick. I am a co-director with the San Francisco Tech Council, and we are a multi-sector collaborative in San Francisco addressing the digital inclusion needs of older adults, that being individuals over the age of 50, and adults with disabilities. And when I say multi-sector collaborative, uh, the thought leadership behind the uh, Tech Council when it was formed in 2015 was that the most effective way to address the digital divide uh, and particularly for the populations that we're focusing on was for uh, organizations to work across sectors and in a unified manner in ways that we could have a greater impact in closing that digital divide. So our membership, um, I would just say the Tech Council is more a convener 
Uh, we bring together these organizations, we share information, uh, we also um, encourage them to kind of engage in discussion and explore ways they can collaborate in kind of acting together within the community to close the digital divide. And we also conduct advocacy. And as part of that membership that we have in the Tech Council, we have 25 leaders from the government, from the nonprofit, from industry, organizations, and from healthcare. We have Kaiser, for example, as an industry partner. And we also have academic partners. And, you know, what we've been doing to date is, um, you know, on a kind of action level is working in partnership with the organizations of the Tech Council is doing tech support pop-ups. And we kind of help coordinate and implement those in community settings in different neighborhoods, uh, in different languages, and we bring volunteers to those events. And then we also have the organizations uh, conduct outreach to uh, make people aware of the event. So we have a lot of older adults who come to those events with their devices, whether it's a tablet or a smartphone. They're paired up with an individual who can speak their language. Uh, we typically are dealing with Spanish, Cantonese, English, some Russian and Vietnamese. Um, and, and, you know, they're just very effective. We get 40, 50 people turn up on each occasion with their devices, get that personal support and get their issues resolved. We've also been doing ACP enrollment assistance events in San Francisco, again, in partnership with these organizations. And we've also been doing tech pilots, looking at equity and innovation as the kind of framework for that and addressing the risk for social isolation that older adults experience. So that's the context of the work that we do. We have been looking very actively at ways that we can do more in healthcare. We have been talking with some local providers here in San Francisco about um, you know, what we can do in collaboration. Uh, we're exploring the role of digital navigators within a healthcare setting and then having protocols developed that would allow the health systems to refer individuals back out to the community where they can get the support they need, whether it's access to affordable connectivity or it's devices that they need or it's training. And I think that's the model that we're starting to see that's taking place across the country is, you know, the health systems, I think, are challenged in many ways in their own internal capacity to support digital inclusion programming within the health system. So putting a digital navigator is probably the most effective resource that they can have within that setting, but then having the protocols that allow them to assess and screen the individual needs and then be able to refer them back out to the community where there are very competent and skilled and experienced organizations that can do the training or do whatever kind of digital inclusion kind of activity is required for, for individuals. I think, you know, just in the context of our work here in San Francisco, the demographics, we're looking at a city that is 25% over the age of 60. Uh, and, you know, we're looking at that rising to 30% by 2030. We're also looking at a large number of that population being low income, multilingual in terms of, you know, uh, many languages spoken in San Francisco and English is not the primary language spoken by many individuals. And I think that really gets to, you know, some of the challenges that we're facing when we're looking at kind of digital inclusion is, you know, the more vulnerable populations, those who are harder to reach and kind of working in partnership with our organizations, you know, to be able to kind of meet their needs and being able to do that in kind of very, uh, kind of, um, uh, in many meaningful ways, you know, for, for, for the populations concerned. I think, you know, uh, you brought up the point here of uh, social determinants of health, and I think, you know, a lot of health systems can also look at the ways that they can integrate, you know, screening for the digital equity needs of individuals uh, as part of that protocol that they put in place with a digital navigator. And then thinking more broadly about, you know, how the digital divide not only 
is affecting health directly, but also the broader social determinants of health, because a lot of individuals require services that need them to go online to be able to get information or to uh, apply for kind of services, etc. So I think there's a very strong case can be made for health systems to think about why they should do this and you know the benefits that it can bring to them directly, but also more broadly in terms of the kind of health uh, needs of the population. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much for that, Andrew, and thank you to all of our um, speakers thus far. Andrew, just a quick note, your sound, I'm not sure if it's just my internet, but your sound mm. was going in a little bit in and out for us. Um, so if folks have questions for you, perhaps they can ask you um, in the next portion as well, because I know you shared a lot and I was able to capture a lot of it, um, but just want to make sure folks know that. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. And thank you um, to all of our speakers for making some time and joining us and sharing. I know a very high level overview of your work. Five minutes definitely is not enough to share everything that you do every day in and out, but hopefully this is a kickstart, a, a, a conversation starter for more collaborative work. Um, thank you, Melanie. So um, I think a lot of folks drop their contacts in the chat, so feel free to follow up as needed. And hopefully we have this group ongoing and continue to grow this family throughout the next few months as we're working on um, the state digital equity plan. So with that, I want to open up um, next slide and um, a community discussion, hoping folks, you know, you're aware of the reactions tool at the bottom of your screen to raise your hands, the chat's available. Um, we have a few prompts to guide our conversation, but I definitely wanted to not restrict you to what you want to share. Um, next slide, please. We have four um, to start off, right? Similar questions that we ask you all during the registration process, but also um, reiterating what we asked our speakers earlier too. And so as I'm reading through this, um, please feel free to answer in any order, um, verbally using the raised hands or in the chat. Um, love to hear from you, building on um, what our speakers mentioned earlier, filling in any gaps that they may have missed, and um, really increasing our our conversation and the dynamics of the work that you all are doing. So um, for one, how do digital equity barriers create health disparities for the covered population that we filled out during um, the poll? Have you or the constituents you serve encounter any barriers in using and or implementing digital health tools? What projects, tools, or resources, right? Not just like the actual devices, but um, what projects or initiatives that you know of have addressed barriers to digital equity as it relates to health outcomes? Um, what are examples of successful partnerships or collaborative initiatives in your communities? So um, let that sink in and feel free to come up on uh, mute to share um, a bit of your insight and your take on any one of these questions. And I'm, I am just now looking over the chat too. I know some folks mentioned in the chat a few of their projects. So I wanna make sure to um, elevate you when I can, but let's see. I'm not seeing any hands yet. Kathy, I feel I, I think you mentioned earlier about the Felton Institute. If you're on the call still, um, may I request you to tell us a little bit more about that? Kathy Spensley. Or Catherine Dodd, are you of the same organization? No. No. Okay. Let me find Kathy and then see if um, they're able to come up mute. Kathy, you're off mute. Hi, hi, great. Hi. Thank you so much. <laughs> no worries. So now I'm trying to find where I am to put my video on here. Sorry. There we go, I think. Yes. Yeah. Hi, hi. Yes, I, I didn't know I would be coming on, but thank you so much. Yes, 
Um, the Felton Institute is involved in about six different counties in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we serve all ages, um, and we also serve um, specialize in mental health um, for all those ages, as well as uh, in our justice services. So we we have worked uh, to with the Tech Council since the beginning, where we're uh, uh, we were um, on the team from the start, and uh, it's been very very helpful to bring everybody together and to start many many programs. At least in San Francisco, where we're particularly strong, but we're also um, involved in Alameda County with the coalition there. And um, we've done some pilots too, to demonstrate really how it transforms people's lives who have not been able to be connected because of affordability, because of, of language barriers, all the barriers everyone's talked about. And I think what we really have to keep in mind is that when we are able to bridge this digital divide and really make a difference with uh, with these folks, um, their life changes dramatically. I mean, it's it's just it's the reward that everyone that works in this field can see. And we recently did a pilot, for example, with some of our folks who have serious mental illness who have really been left behind uh, in this uh, digital divide. They're older and they have uh, disabilities that are functional impairments that are significant. However, we have found that with, you know, individual coaching with people they trust, it takes, it takes some initial uh, effort to really make this uh, the incentive for them to want to do it, think they can learn because they don't believe they can, et cetera. It changes their lives so that really, as a clinician, I would say it, for some people, it is the number one intervention to bring them back from uh, uh, their disability and into back into a world where they can really participate. And that is just a beautiful thing. So as hard as this work is, I think it really keeps us going to see those that tremendous success. But it takes a lot of upfront effort on the part of funding to fund people's time, to be able to spend that one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't have to be forever, but to get the people to, to really want to think, want to do it, believe they can learn, and to have that initial support is really, really critical. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Of course it's helpful. Thank you. And Catherine. Thank you very much. I'm Catherine Dodd. I'm a um, PhD prepared registered nurse. I've been working in the field of electromagnetic radiation um, now for four years. And probably I want to first say the digital divide has been artificially created by the telecom companies um, in areas across the country, and there are thousands of them, um, where municipally regulated, wired to the premises, um, internet availability exists. It can be regulated so that if we put it in San Francisco, for example, where, where a former supervisor attempted to do, folks in low income areas would be subsidized by the people who were in high income areas. It, it's managed by, like a utility. The importance of that is that you aren't at the mercy of the for profit telecom companies who not only raise rates without notice, but also try to sell you things that you don't really need. So I just want to point that out in terms of social determinants of health. It's not just internet accessibility. It's um, it, it's uh, the corporate impact on the social determinants of health. Um, in terms of health outcomes, uh, we there's thousands of articles about neurodevelopment and exposure to wireless radiation, which is why I'm advocating for whenever you say broadband, you say wired broadband or safe broad safer broadband. Um, EWG did a research last year that showed that the FCC's levels that are allowed for wireless radiation are 400 times what is actually safe um, for infants and children. Kaiser Northern California researchers have done research on pregnant women um, and documented long term on the offspring impacts on ADHD, on asthma, on diabetes, all related to holding a cell phone for 30 minutes a day near, near their pregnant belly. Um, the, the technology itself is untested and, um, and no one has looked at the cumulative effects. Our national toxicology program has done one research project and then the rest have been quashed 
um, that documented that it increases glial cells, or which cause glioblastomas, um, when a 3G telephone is within a, what would be equivalent uh, radius for a human. Um, and those tests have been uh, reduplicated and with the same outcomes at what would be the NIH of Italy. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the institute. So um, I wanted to say that. And then on the other hand, um, as a practitioner, um, for a long time, we've had advice nurses. That's a form of telehealth. And we, uh, and I agree, uh, video telehealth is, is extremely effective and extremely important. Um, and it needs to be wired, especially with a mental health population, because um, electromagnetic frequencies cross the blood brain barrier. They create um, reactive oxygen species that ultimately become, um, create as, uh, create, oh God, the name is escaping me. I apologize. I'm having a digital, um, a digital breakdown. At any rate, um, one, we need to make telehealth reimbursable for registered nurses and nurse practitioners, um, which they did during COVID, but that was a special period. Um, and two, so that's on the one hand and on the other hand, we, oxidative stress, um, uh, wireless radiation creates oxidative stress and it it does um, affect brain signaling and breaks down um, dna strands so uh, while i support wireless and i'm on a wireless laptop right now i'm not you know i'm not saying it's all bad we have to push the companies to make safer um, wireless products that ha that protect from radiation and that use um, lower levels of energy uh, you can get modems that have low um, energy output. So I just want to say it's not a panacea. It's not perfectly safe. And we have to, as consumers, we have to demand safety. Untested technology, untested technology, baby diapers with wireless um, chips in them that notify mom and dad when the baby's wet. That You do not want a wireless chip next to your infant's genitals. I, and I don't want to sound crazy. I mean, I worked in San Francisco. I worked for the Board of Supervisors. I worked for the mayor. I'm, you know, I'm a scientist by background, and this is an untested technology that we need to be careful of. Thanks. Thank you for your comment, Catherine. And Mark, I see that in the chat that you had a hard time Raising hands, but hopefully you're the future of the getting older and it's getting harder for me to do things when it comes to my computer. No worries. Glad you're here. Thank you for all your help. I was, so um, I'm Mark Deal. I'm with California Coverage and Health Initiative, CCHI. We're an association of nonprofit local government agencies that help people enroll in subsidized health insurance and access their health care services. Um, so from my perspective, what we're talking about health and digital divide, it comes from getting people enrolled in subsidized health insurance coverage and making sure they can access their healthcare services. Just to, you see the lenses that I'm looking at the world through for my day job. But um, one of the things that I'm really excited about is uh, Leticia from CETF came to me uh, earlier in the year. It was, I was flagged by Scott to talk about how we can get some pilot mass marketing outreach programs out there to let people know about the incredible benefits that are available to them. Um, so I've been trying to do it on a shoestring budget or at no cost. And just recently this last week, um, I got a group that we do texting with to agree to uh, run a pilot project with us. I got Comcast to agree to do a pilot project with us in Riverside County. So CCHI is going to be working with CETF, um, Riverside County, Comcast, Harmony Health, and the State Association of Counties, and then local partners to run a pilot project focusing on 50,000 Riverside County residents who are income eligible for subsidized broadband to make sure that they get texts about the information and video ads across platforms. This is similar to what we do for health insurance enrollment, right? So currently we're in the early to middle phases of a five-year Medi-Cal outreach and enrollment project, partnering with DHCS and CMS. 
um, part of that campaign, we're running out 28 million video ads across platforms. So on people's computers, TVs, gaming consoles, phones. Um, so far we've run about 4 million of those 28 million ads and we're getting about an 80% of the ads reviewed in completion all the way through, which is pretty fantastic, right? I know a lot of ads I'll click off of when I get the chance. Um, so we're hoping to get similar results with this project. Uh, those ads right now are just in English and Spanish. We'd love to have them in more languages, but those are the primary languages that we serve with local community partners. We also have a texting campaign that we're running right now. Um, and these programs are out across 25 counties. We have about two and a half million texts going out in our texting campaign. And our platform has a backend AI system that translates things into the messages into 113 different languages based on language preference that we have in our database. Currently, we've only had to use 63 of the languages, but the good news is we've got no corrections or complaints in the 63 languages that we've sent out the text in. On the first round of text, we're getting about a 14.4% click-through rate and only about a 2.4% opt-out rate, which we're, we're pretty thrilled with. And by the time somebody gets their sixth text, we again, we get about an 80% click-through rate for, through those texts. So we're ex really excited to expand these projects into Riverside County for the pilot project. And each of those video ads and texts has zip code specific referral information to a local entity to provide assistance to those individuals. So right now we're working to find which local entities we need to refer people to. Um, we just got the organizations to agree to partner with us at no cost to put those together. Um, and now we're seeing if we need to find some seed funding for the lo local entities to assist with filling out the forms and getting people connected to the broadband coverage. But the, I mean, those are a couple of our highlights on it, but I'll tell you more about it once we get close to launching the project. I just uh, wanted to let you know how excited I am that we finally have this moving forward. And Leticia, mostly I wanted to tell you that um, thank you for bringing this to our attention and asking us to work with you on this because it's, it's happening and we'll be launching the project probably in the next six weeks. Thank you for coming on to give us a preview of it. We're really excited to see um, your, your collaboration and what that would lead to. I um, want to make sure that I don't, I lost track of who raised their hands first. I also want to make sure folks in the chat is able to come off um, mute too. Um, Paul, I see your hand first. So I'll have you unmute and then Michael Liao, if I can find you in Participant list, I'll elevate you as well. Paul? Uh, Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Paul Hickman. I work for San Francisco Community Liberal Campaign. I am a friendly companion outreach worker. And I just want to speak on an example for successful partnership and collaborate in the communities for digital. Like we have a uh, very good tech program for our with seniors and adults that we have. We have Zoom and help work with the cell phones and stuff. And seeing that now that COVID is dying down a little bit, we're trying to get folks to come in. You know, we do a lot of Zoom classes, but now we have our, our tech lab open for in-person um, classes. And I am the in-between person. Like to get folks connected, it will, you know, what Safe for the Community Partnership does, you know, you have activities that you have an in-between person who I go out and visit folks and um, get a relationship and just talk about internet and about cell phones and get to them. Because a lot of the seniors who I know, I'm a senior, they are a little paranoid of technology, uh, cell phones and iPhones and messing with a computer. And so, but I'll tell them, I said, oh, it's easy. And I show them what I do or whatever. 
and I will escort them to any place, any computer lab. Like one good thing about the Tenderloin in the summer, we have the Curry Center and O'Farrell Senior Center that have very good tech labs that's very open for all the community. But we just need somebody to get these folks comfortable getting in touch with the technology. You know, because a lot of folks are just really kind of scared to um, uh, paranoid to uh, get out and do things. But lately, folks, I've been going with them to school folks, and they're very interested, you know, because I show them how, use, how easy it is. And I escort them to a tech lab, and they get connected. And that's really important to get full connected because, you know, since the pandemic, you know, they've been isolated. And I just, just helped them not to be isolated, to get out and meet people. And I told them how, that, that they can go on Zoom and talk to their relatives all over the country and meet folks without being in person. And so there's a lot of good things going on in the community, successful things. Thank you so much for sharing that, Paul. And thank you for your, your work as the digital navigator in the community. And then I uh, want to make sure Michael, Michael, yeah. Hi, Let's good morning. That. Good morning. Yes, Hi. That's exactly right. Um, so my name is Michael. I'm the director of programs at Nikos Chinese Health Coalition. We're a small nonprofit uh, located physically in San Francisco's Chinatown, but we work with San Francisco Chinese and Asian American communities in general. I did put some thoughts in the chat, but we're really seeing uh, um, a lot of kind of uneven um, uh, access to digital resources within the communities that we serve with. Um, you know, Nikos actually has primarily been addressing the opposite end of the spectrum with younger generations having too much access. A lot of Asian American immigrant children, um, you know, uh, have reported high rates of um, screen use and gaming that have led to addictions and other associated um, physical and mental health harms. Um, and then you have immigrant parents who kind of are in between, who have access to technology, but also have language and other challenges to um, have hard time um, understanding or being able to regulate what their children are doing online. And then of course, we have the older generations that um, uh, we, which I think is the, you know, obviously is the main purpose of this working group. And it's so great that there's this convening um, that are addressing um, folks who have a lot of challenges and barriers to access. I think there's been some great programs and some of our partner organizations in San Francisco have been doing to um, kind of bridge those two worlds, right? To have, um, uh, digitally uh, access and, and savvy teens and young people serve as mentors and, and trainers and educators in, to lead classes for seniors in language, in the language that they understand, um, to learn how to use tablets, to learn how to get on the Zoom call so that they could access telehealth. I think those have been really um, amazing partnerships and, and to, you know, also in a way for younger folks who might be using too much screen to learn how to, you know, give back to the community, how to use their knowledge for good, how to, um, you know, participate in more active um, screen use, right? Um, so I just wanted to share that and, and happy to, um, you know, connect more with folks to offline. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that and definitely think the, the youth can play a role in as digital navigators and helping the community bridge the digital divide too. Um, and then Mickey, I think AJ Middleton, I uh, wanna make sure that you're able to come off mute. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Hello everyone, my name is AJ Middleton. I'm with Human IT. We're a nonprofit um, founded out of Los Angeles with the mission to bridge the, the digital divide. So we support households um, really with digital navigation services and accessing resources from 
for your low cost devices, assistance in getting connected to the internet and navigating you know, programs like ACP or other low cost offers, digital um, skills training, and then technical support. Um, we've ran some programs with um, you know, health clinics, many different um, organizations with a focus on getting pe people connected to things like telehealth. Um, really from that digital navigation perspective of understanding what each individual's situation is, having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with them to understand the goals that they're trying to accomplish, and then providing them those resources in order to accomplish those goals. So us in-house, as I mentioned, we can help them access free or low-cost devices. We help people navigate programs like HTTP and the application process that comes with that from telling them where to get documents, how to attain those, um, who to ask, and then what is needed to actually fill out these applications and then take that benefit to a provider of their choice, um, as well as digital skills training, you know, as early on as, you know, what a computer is, how to access, um, you know, the internet, uh, email and um, email basics, and then really taking that to other courses as well that they may um, have more advanced needs for. And then the final aspect of that would be that technical support. Um, we're talking a lot about technology access when that access is attained, um, ensuring that people, you know, continue to receive that. If something goes wrong, where did they go? What, who do they ask for those questions? who helps troubleshoot and fix and replace. Um, and we provide that service um, here as well. We're here to support um, you know, across the entire state of California. And I would love to kind of offer that as a resource to any entity that's looking to provide these resources to their community um, as, as early on as an awareness aspect of it, um, all the way into you know, providing that direct support. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Cindy, I see that your your camera is on, so and then your raise hand too. So I want to make sure to call on you. Oh, thank you for calling on me. This is such an important topic, and I really appreciate that you're um, you're holding these um, webinars. Um, and, and once again, I want to talk about the safe technology um, as being part of the toolkit that uh, people can bring to people who want digital equity. Um, I've been working with a group of uh, disabled seniors in a low income development in Sebastopol, California, and I go into their homes, they, they've got headaches, they've got all these problems because they live in these very small spaces and often they have the Wi-Fi router right next to their bed. Um, they live in studios um, and also they have shared walls with people who have Wi-Fi routers right next to them. So they're developing all these symptoms, they don't know what's going on. So I go into their uh, apartments I, I bring out our radio frequency radiation meter. I can tell what the levels are. I show them and then we bring ethernet cables. We connect the ethernet cables um, and we have to contact the providers. Um, and often they use DSL, which is going through the copper landlines. Um, and then we talk to the providers who can take the routers and turn the, the signal off at the source. Sometimes it's difficult and it doesn't happen right away. Several calls are needed. But there's also, I bring in these pouches, they're, they're shielded pouches and you can put the routers inside the pouches. And as long as you have the ethernet cable, the signal is blocked. So that's a really important toolkit for anyone who's talking about digital equity to bring to many people in the EMF disabled community. It's really easy, it's kind of a win-win for, for everybody. It's important to keep that in the conversation for anyone as an option. So just wanted to add that, but thank you for this. Thank you, Sydney. Um, and yes, thank you for sharing. Um, just want to make sure, Wendy, um, you get a chance to come off mute. There we go. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Um, so, uh thank you for calling me i just want i wanted to say um that i have put this in the chat um but basically some things that um that that problems I've encountered with um, uh, digital health equity is for one thing, um, I am constantly being bombarded 
by tech or you know by other people to um by the health system basically to go online and sign up for our my digital health record okay and this this can be a turn off partially because i have uh um paper medical records that you know i have kept and stuff like that and there's no integration um and, and it kind of feels like um uh you're being asked to uh abandon the way that has worked for you into another uh way that works better for uh, for uh the health system okay uh i'm not totally against this i'm just saying that uh health systems needs to be able to offer um uh digital support um in order to 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 access these health records and needs to be and it also needs to be continual in order to integrate um uh you know uh paper health records uh by the consumer to a digital health record um i'm uh there needs to be people that um that supports this in the hospital setting or in the clinic um, instead of being referred somewhere else. Because as soon as I walk out the door, I don't want to be thinking about, um, uh, you know, so I don't adopt it. And I'm, I'm you know, somewhat di digitally literate. I have uh, a phone. Uh, I have a smartphone. I have a laptop at home. I have internet at home. Okay. And, um, so, um, and the support should be there um, should be there to help that. But more importantly, it also needs to be able to be accessed on nights and weekends. This is when I do most of my digital work go online and stuff like that on nights and weekends because during the day it competes with other um uh demands including going to appointments running errands and uh you know and some folks work okay i i'm not i don't need to work at, at, at the present time and stuff like that but um these are things that needs to be thought of um so an example i would like to suggest um is that once upon a time this is way before COVID. I think this is probably 10 or 15 years ago. I Wendy, went into, yes. Wendy, I'm, my apologies. Just to make sure we're on time and also giving um, time for others to speak, may, I may ask you to wrap up. So I have a possible uh, solution. And what that is, is uh, I went once into a senior center to charge um, uh, a, a laptop. And just by my my being there, people came up and asked me questions about what I'm doing, and then they got interested. And, you know, and this was in a small group setting. And so I'm suggesting that instead of either a class or one on one, that there be these small groups that people can ask each other questions and maybe help each other out instead of, um, you know, either one extreme or another. And that it needs to be in a community. Um, so that's that's what I'm suggesting. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And I'm sure the community members on this call will take um, your comment. I um, want to make sure to call on Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, really great discussion uh, today. Really, really um, fabulous information for myself and uh, wanted to say that um, similar to human IT, we do offer the same digital literacy. We help um, uh, your referrals, your learners uh, receive a device. We help with getting a uh, low cost broadband, including the ACP. We have been training 
um, folks in senior centers and community centers and libraries for over 15 years. And with COVID, we focused on older adults and teaching them remotely how to use telemedicine um, and telehealth and order groceries and medications and do Zoom with family and friends, reducing isolation. And as a result of that work over the past three years, we are now offering our knowledge to other participants and nonprofits that want to train their own staff so that they can um, help a, a new learner come in. Um, we are um, partnered with some of the counties with the state money that just came down for, um, from the ATT. And we're happy to see if you qualify under those counties and um, just be a resource as well with any information that somebody might need or want and see, uh, also see if we're a good fit. But if not, direct you in an area um, that might help you as well. So what, what, the only thing we don't do is technical support. Um, so we do not do that, we refer out. So, um, but we do support uh, older adults in many, many ways. And the impact that that has on a life is um, very, very motivating for all of us at Community Tech Network. So thank you all for your work and I'm really happy to be part of this group, thank you. Thank you, Lauren, and um, with that, um, thank you everyone who came off mute to share um, about your organizations and your work and also your personal experiences. Um, in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next portion um, of the agenda, and um, I hope I called at least one person from your organization to speak today um, as we want to make room for all those who are involved. Um, next slide, please. And so um, next up, we'll talk through how to take action. We talk through the barriers and the um, programs that are existing in the community. And next, we want to make sure that we're able to capture all those data in um, our plan. And so Richna, you mind coming off mute to share us what we should do to help. Thank you so much, Anne. Hi, everyone. My name is Richna Vass. I work with Broadband Equity Partnership. We serve as program consultants and advisors to the California Department of Technology, and we are assisting with the state digital equity planning process. Next slide. So you heard Anne mention how we are excited to hear about all these programs and projects that you're working on, but we do need to collect data in a systematic way to be able to show what's been happening um, throughout the state. So we are actually going to release two surveys. Um, one is a survey targeting organizations and it's called the Digital Equity Ecosystem Mapping Tool. And the other survey is the Digital Equity Public Survey which targets um, California households. The public survey is meant to address or identify barriers to digital equity as they relate to broadband accessibility, affordability and adoption. This survey is going to be available in multiple languages and it will have audio functionality so that um, limited English proficiency communities and those with limited literacy are able to hear the questions um, being asked in their own languages. Uh, we hope to release this survey in the coming weeks. We will actually make paper versions of the survey available during um, regional and local events. So we encourage you to stay tuned, uh, more information about this to come. Next slide. The other survey that I mentioned earlier, the DEEM tool, is meant to collect data from organizations, just like the data that you're sharing with us today. Many of you have um, put in the chat information about your uh, projects, your programs, your plans. It's a wonderful thing to be able to learn about it during these sessions, but we would love to know more. We would like to get more granular information about what you're offering to communities throughout the state of California, especially the communities that um, are part of covered populations. Uh, so the digital equity ecosystem mapping tool is available in English and Spanish. It is now live. We highly encourage you to um, click on one of the links that we actually just dropped into the chat 
uh, whether it's the English version or the Spanish version, and please complete this tool as thoroughly as possible. The kind of data that we're looking for is it runs the gamut, right? If you have program information you want to share with us, send us that. If you have mapping tools and information that you want to share with us with broadband data that's been collected, share that with us. We would love to hear what you've been doing to address uh, digital equity in your communities. Next slide. We now have um, an outreach toolkit for you to be able to push this out with your partner entities. So many of you have mentioned that you work with other entities to, um, to deliver services and programs to communities. So please share the DEEM tool, share the toolkit with your partner entities so that we can push this out to as many organizations in California and really get a comprehensive understanding of what's going on in our communities to better understand what's being offered, where the programs are being offered and to whom the programs are being offered. Next slide. So in the uh, outreach toolkit that we've included in the chat, you will see um, some collateral material that will have a, a QR code that you can scan. Please start filling out this tool. It is live, it is available to be completed today. Um, and again, share this out with faith-based organizations, with community-based organizations, with um, state agencies, any entity that leverages technology to provide a program and service, that's the entity that we want to hear from. So please complete this tool today, share with us your information, and we hope to hear about what you're offering uh, in detailed format very soon. And with that, I'll hand this over to Anne. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richna and Scott. I would like to make a comment too. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, actually, Anne, I, I just wanted to kind of underscore um, and you know the call to action that that Rich and I had issued. And hi, everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Scott Adams. I'm the deputy director of uh, broadband and digital literacy at the California Department of Technology, and and our team is um, really uh, working to lead the effort on behalf of the state to develop the digital equity plan. And so. Um, you know, as we mentioned at the top, this working group is is part of a sort of a, a five component process to develop the plan per the guidance um, from the NTIA. Um, the importance of the plan here is to identify the digital equity barriers of the eight covered populations and then tie those to, um, uh, you know, policy priority areas uh, of the state. And so health is one of those. What is um, the importance of you know getting your support on both the um, residential data gathering and the organizational gathering is that we are required as part of the digital equity plan um, to um, solicit um, or not solicit but to gather data from residents on their barriers. So we need your partnership to promote the online version of the tool out into the community. Um, on the digital equity mapping tool that um, Rich and I talked about, another requirement of the digital equity plan is to do a comprehensive asset inventory of um, organizations, programs, resources, et cetera. And so that is the importance of the digital equity mapping tool um, to help us get that. And it is a requirement that all of us will need to put together in the digital equity plan in order to get the large digital equity um, capacity dollars to implement this plan. And so um, really thank all of you for both the subject matter expertise, the, um, um, the understanding of how digital equity helps the, or, or um, empowers outcomes in healthcare and um, um, just know it's a multi-step process. And so um, we're going to ask a lot of you all in partnership and are looking forward to your support. And Anne, back to you. Thank you, Scott. And um, in regarding to this slide, just a quick summary of um, ways to get involved, right? We're, we'll be together for the next few months, um, but want to make sure these are top of mind for you um, in terms of engaging on with us on our portal, completing the team tool that Richna and Scott just talked through, um, the surveys, the participating in our outcome area working groups and attend our local events. Um, for those who you know 
time-wise, virtually-wise, it's not work. We want to meet you in person as well. And I'll talk through those um, in the next few slides in more details. But um, I would like to bring up Gladys to talk through ways that you immediately can be involved. Um, next slide, please. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Scott. And thanks um, to the CDT team. They really have been doing an amazing job with these engagements with the working group and, um, and all the other upcoming conversations. So thank you um, to the team. Um, there, as you can, as you've heard, there are so many ways to get involved. Um, and so this is just another um, way um, for you to, to give um, NTIA, your input. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Gladys Palpalatuk. I am the federal program officer, one of two federal program officers, FPOs, um, for from NTIA, and um, we are about to release in um, in this quarter, um, or at the end of this quarter, a NOFO, a Notice of Funding Opportunity for two upcoming programs that are the next phases of after this planning phase that we are in now with CDT. Um, and so these are opportunities for your voices and for your community's voices to be heard um, in the development of these NOFOs. Again, notice of funding opportunities. They are the State Digital Equity Capacity and Grant Program um, and the Competitive Digital Equity Program. Um, these are two funding phases. One, the State Capacity Grant Program will be a program administered by an entity likely to be CDT, um, but by by the state of California. Um, and then the competitive digital equity program will be a competitive grant program administered by NTIA. Both those programs are in development. Um, you can read about them at these links. Um, there are questions posed to be answered. Um, and they're really to, um, again, hear from you all what your needs, some of your um, input into the development of what the notice of funding opportunity should include or, or not include. Um, and so the deadline for submission is 5 p.m. Eastern time at, on May 1st. Um, the link is there. And I will also include in chat now um, the links directly. So you can just click on them and start looking at them and formulating your yours and your organization's um, um, comments for a submission. Uh, last on my, in the chat is also my um, contact information. Um, so if you have any questions, please um, feel free to contact me, me um, and I will I will answer the questions as best I can or get an answer for you. And that'll be it. Thank you again. And back to Anne. Thanks so much, Gladys. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. To assess promise, more details. Um, one, two, and three essentially I'll outline what our working group will be um, working on, our outcomes for the next um, few months. And so just to re reiterate what's on the slide, develop strategies that align with state digital equity plan priorities as informed by results of our public survey and the DEAN tool. We'll conduct a gap analysis once we find out what's available and what's working well in California um, to inform and conduct further research, evaluate our assets, and develop recommendations to include within um, the SDEP specifically for our, our outcome area working group is for health. Um, so next slide, please. And then just for some upcoming dates for our virtual outcome area working group meetings, same time, 11 to 11.30 or 10 to 11.30 p.m. Um, I'm sorry, I'm messing this up. 10 to 11.30 a.m. Pacific time. Um, in May, we will be discussing what digital equity programs are currently working well in the community and what's missing. And then in June, we'll be looking at the public survey and deemed data to further shape um, SDEP priorities. And next slide, please. And with that, um, I conclude our presentation. Here are some of our contact information should you want to engage further. As I said earlier on, all the materials, um, recording, transcript, and presentation will be available on our broadband portal as events. And thank you for joining us and have a great day. I'll stop recording now.